Hey guys, this is the Scholar Juno, more Jian than Bing. So today I want to talk about heat treatment on Chinese blades because nowadays there's two common types of heat treatment that you'll find. So I'm going to talk about the history of these different types of heat treatments in China and then I'm going to talk about, you know, what are the advantages and disadvantages of these different heat treatments. And one of them is tempering. In a tempered blade you have a blade that's basically a spring. Now this blade is a little bit stiff but technically, <laughs> I can barely bend it here, but technically this is a tempered blade which means it helps it absorb shock whenever you're cutting things and stuff. Another type of heat treatment is called differential hardening and if you look closely you can see the edge of this blade has like a pattern or a line on it. That is differential heat treatment. The spine is soft and the edge is hard. It's yeah it's just different. That's what it means. It means that the heat treatment on the edge is different than the heat treatment on the spine and you get a harder edge and a softer spine um, and Differentially heat treated blades can have a little bit of springiness, but they don't have as much springiness as tempered blades. Now to begin we have to talk about a little bit about steel metallurgy and this will get a little technical, but It's you know, it's interesting stuff at least according to me. I hope it's interesting for you, too <laughs> So let's begin by asking the question. Why would someone heat treat in the first place? What does it actually do and I made a video before this one where I talked about ways that smiths would you know spread i spread carbon around in iron in the, in the steel blades basically where they would want to have like more carbon in the edge and less carbon in the spine and all that stuff however you can only do so much by you know pounding on steel with a hammer and moving carbon around carbon around in it heat treatment allows the smith to control the carbon within the blade at like a whole nother level like an atomic level let's say we have a piece of steel that we've hammered into a blade shape the problem is that the distribution of carbon atoms and iron atoms will not be homogeneous to the blade what's common is what's called perlite and this means that it's a form of steel where the carbon atoms have completely separated from the iron atoms and they're existing as pockets. So you have pockets of carbon or pearls of carbon, it's called perlite. This is one of the weakest forms of steel because you're taking the carbon and you're like clumping it together in certain sections and you want it to be more evenly distributed. How does the smith go about, you know, taking those carbon clumps and breaking them down? And adding heat. Basically you add heat and whenever the steel gets hot enough it will transition from you know perlite into what's called austenite which is a state where the everything kind of opens up and the carbon atoms kind of distribute themselves a lot more evenly within the matrix of iron atoms. However if you let the blade cool back down again either it will it will revert back to perlite Let's say a smith just hammered out a blade and the carbon atoms like you have perlite here or something else here. It's just kind of all over the place because he's been heating it up and pounding it and it just kind of makes a mess. So one common thing to do is actually to heat the blade up and let it cool down at room temperature a few times. And this is called normalizing. And that what that does is it resets all of the steel in the entire blade to perlite. So you have at least one, even though perlite's weak and it's not really what you want, for a sword, ideally, uh, it will make sure that all the carbon, at least it's all consistent. And consistency is very important for what comes next. So after you have your blade made of perlite, you can heat it up back into austenite and, you know, get all those carbon atoms and put them evenly through the sword. And rather than letting it cool at room temperature and letting the carbon atoms clump back together in pockets, you quench the blade. And what this does is it locks, if it cools, if the blade cools quickly enough, it will lock those carbon atoms in and won't let them group up together. And this forms what's called martensite. Martensite is a very, you know, hard substance, but it's also somewhat brittle. Quenching a blade introduces a lot of stress because it's a giant temperature fluctuation and your blade can warp or break potentially if it's not done properly. And once you have a martensite blade, what you can do is you can heat it back up a little bit, not to the state of austenite, but you can heat it up a little more. It will loosen some of the tension within the structure and it will form what's called tempered martensite. You lose some of the hardness and strength of martensite, but what you gain is toughness in the form of flexibility. So the blade will be able to flex and not snap. In China, 
Quenching blades was commonplace by the late Warring States period, so this is before the First Emperor unified China, and the practice of tempering dates back at least to the Western Han Dynasty. You know, you have these spring-tempered blades, and we actually, there are collectors in China now who have antique Han Dynasty jin, or swords, and they are springy. They are really flexible, actually. In China, during the Han Dynasty, they actually had spring-tempered blades, but what's fascinating is that you know, nowadays people will say the spring temper blades are the best, but in China they actually transitioned away from spring temper blades and came up with a new form of heat treatment at the time. This new form of heat treatment is called differential hardening, and how you do it is you basically, you get your blade, and before tempering or anything like that, whenever you are going to quench the blade, you actually, there's two ways to do it. You either only quench the edge and you leave the spine of the blade out of the cool water or you put clay on the blade you put clay on all the blade except the edge and then you quench it so that the edge cools much quick much quicker than the spine it's actually debated when exactly the method of using clay on the blade was used as a when quenching. Some will argue that it's the first or the very early form of differential hardening that occurred in China and others will argue that it was started later in Japan. I'm not going to talk about that at all here. I just know that you can make a differential hardening blade either by quenching part of it, just quenching the edge, or by coating the blade with clay and leaving the edge exposed. So you have a hard martensite edge but your spine will still be perlite or you know something in between. Another factor that plays into this is the type of liquid that you use to quench your blade. The oldest form was to simply use water. Now water is can cool things very quickly and that means that the quicker you cool the blade the harder it is but the more risky the process of quenching is. You can actually damage the blade. Oil will actually cool the blade a little more slowly than water and it's a little bit safer to use oil as a, for a quench. Um, but it doesn't get the, it doesn't get the edge quite as hard. That contrasts with something that uh, has a lot of salt in it, so like salt water or urine, something salty. And if you quench the blade in a you know salty water, then it will cool even faster than water. So it becomes more risky, but the steel edge will get even harder. By the time of the northern and southern dynasties in China, it's very firmly established that they understand this process of how oil and how salt water affect the quench of the blade. In China the first cases of differential hardening are from the Western Han Dynasty. At that point in history China had both spring tempered and differentially hardened blades but in the competition between the two differential hardening actually won out over tempering despite what many people nowadays will say about spring tempering being the, the better of the two. So now let's get to the interesting question of why ancient China went from having these fancy spring-tempered swords towards having these differentially hardened swords, which contrasts with a lot of modern opinion. I think that the transition from tempered blades towards differentially hardened blades actually pretty much goes along with the transition from the straight sword to the saber in, the, in warfare. So in China, they started out using straight double-edged swords for war, but during the Eastern Han Dynasty, a switch was made where they basically switched to single-edged blades and almost for the rest of Chinese history, that was pretty much all the swords or a vast majority of the swords used in war were dao or single-edged blades. And I think that heat treatment may have played some part in this because if you look at the Han Jian, they are quite narrow, slender blades, and it, they need to be spring-tempered. If you were to use differential hardening on them, I don't think they would. I think that they would bend and stay bent far too easily. But if you make a doll or a single-edged blade, it allows you to make a very thick spine, where it resists bending much more than a narrow or slimmer double-edged sword. In my opinion, I think the wider spine and the stiffness of the doll actually facilitated the use of differential hardening as a to become a more widespread form of heat treatment. And the big advantage of differential hardening is simply hardness, and which means you get a sh an edge that stays sharper for longer. And you can never underestimate 
how useful it is to have a very sharp edge or an edge that will stay sharp for longer without having to be resharpened and without warping or bending at the edge. In addition to allowing you to have a harder edge, differential hardening also will actually make the blade harder to bend in the first place. There's a metallurgical measurement called Young's modulus, and what this just means is stiffness. Now, this blade is tempered, right? And it's stiff anyway because of its geometry, its shape, but it's important to know that if this blade wasn't spring-tempered, if it was simply differentially hardened, then it would actually be slightly harder to bend than it is now. Not, I'm not talking about changing the shape at all, just the state, because whenever you make it a spring, it makes it where it can bend to a much greater degree and have a lot more yield strength but it, doesn't, it actually slightly decreases the overall stiffness. So it will bend slightly easier, but it will bend way further and return to true. With a differentially hardened blade, on the other hand, it is a little harder to bend initially, but if you do bend it to, to a certain amount, it will stay bent much more easily than a spring-tempered blade. So I think that the slight stiffness and mostly the sharpness given in combination with the thicker spine of the doll just kind of allowed the differential hardening to take take precedent for warfare and then that later on influenced straight sword design the widespread use of differential hardening eventually was also applied to tian or the straight sword the spring tempered blades actually fell out in china during the ming and qing dynasties you don't really have spring tempered tian you all blades are differentially hardened i believe that with uh, modern steels you can make a pretty strong argument that spring tempering is inherently better because we have very homogeneous modern steels that you can, you know, really, really flex and bend to an extreme degree and they'll return to true. However, in the, you know, pre-modern, pre-industrial era, I don't think that this, you, you definitely had spring-tempered blades, but I don't think that they were nearly as robust as modern steels. And because of that, I think that differential hardening actually played an important and very good rival or counterpart to spring tempering. All right, everybody, so that's it for this video. Uh, let me know what you think. I look forward to reading your comments below and seeing what you guys' thoughts are on the differences and the advantages of differential hardening over spring tempering. I'll see you all next time. Stay sharp.